Let me start with a relatively simple case of rotating a vector on a 2D plane. Consider a vector v with a length of r at an angle phi with the x-axis. The cosine of phi is defined as the x component of v divided by its length. Similarly, the sine of phi equals the y component of v divided by its length. From this we can write vector v in terms of the angle phi. It's also easy to show that the squares of cosine and sine of phi add up to 1. Now let's try rotating v by an angle theta, which transforms v to a new vector v prime. The angle between v prime and the x axis is the sum of phi and theta, which we can use to get the x and y components of v prime. Using these trigonometric identities, we can split the terms as functions of phi and theta like this. Next, we can replace the sine and cosine of phi with x and y components of v. The length of the vector cancels out, which makes sense because rotating a vector doesn't change its length. And we are left with transformed x and y components, written in terms of the original x and y components and the angle theta. Writing this in matrix form, we get the rotation matrix in two dimensions. Going to three dimensions, you can see that only the vector components on the plane of rotation are affected. The component that's parallel to the axis of rotation and therefore perpendicular to the plane of rotation remains the same. So it's rather easy to expand this matrix for three-dimensional rotations. We simply add an extra row and column with zeros and a one that will copy over the component that's not affected. This particular matrix is the rotation matrix about the z-axis. We can get the rotation matrices about x and y axis using a fun trick without doing any calculations. Now we have all rotation matrices for each axis, but what to do if we wanted to rotate a vector about an arbitrary axis? Looking at the vector v again and the unit vector that will be the axis of rotation for v, we can decompose v into its parallel and perpendicular component with respect to vector a. The parallel component is the projection of v onto a, which is a simple dot product in the direction of a. Because vector v is the sum of its components, we can easily get the perpendicular component by subtracting the parallel part from v. Looking at these vectors in three dimensions, we can see that although we don't have the good old x, y, z axis to work with here, we already have two axes which are perpendicular to each other. So all we need is another axis that's perpendicular to these two, which together form the three axes we need for our rotation matrix. The third axis is easily found by using a cross product of v and the rotation axis. We can show that the perpendicular component of v has the same length as this new axis, assuming that a is a unit vector. Rotating vector v by theta around a will transform v to v prime. It will also transform v perpendicular to v p. Looking at the rotation plane, we see a picture that's quite similar to what we had earlier, where we studied the rotation of v in the xy plane. Except now the x-axis is replaced by v perpendicular, and the y-axis is replaced by the cross product of a and v. Another difference is that now our new axis contain the length information of the vector, whereas x and y axes were unit vectors. For this reason, we don't have to include the length of vector vp in the trigonometric notation. The transformed vector v prime is again the sum of its components, which are all known at this point. Writing each component explicitly in terms of v and a and refactoring, we get the final equation for rotating v around the unit axis a.
Please remember this last equation as it will come back in our discussion of quaternions. As an exercise, you can try to reproduce the 3D rotation matrices from earlier when the rotation vector A is one of the x, y, and z axes. Now let's have a look at complex numbers again. We already had an encounter with complex numbers when we did the Mandelbrot fractals. Here we'll have a short recap and we'll examine some properties of complex numbers that have to do with rotations. Complex numbers are defined as points on the complex plane, consisting of a real axis and an imaginary axis. In most cases, complex numbers are written as a sum of a real number plus an imaginary number. However, we can also write them as a scalar part and a vector part. The vector part is a one-dimensional vector in the direction of the imaginary axis. We can add two complex numbers in the same way we add vectors. Multiplication is also the same, except i squared evaluates to minus 1. Another property of complex numbers is the complex conjugate, which simply flips the sign of the imaginary part of the complex number. Multiplying a complex number with its conjugate equals the square distance of that number to the origin. We can use that to calculate the magnitude of the vector from the origin to the complex number. When we multiply a complex number by another complex number, we'll always get a number that's also on the complex plane. Although the length of the resulting vector can vary, it's easy to see that multiplying is the same as rotating the vector about the origin. So, can we think of a set of complex numbers that will preserve the length of our vector after multiplication? Well, of course we can. Any complex number with unit length will not change the magnitude of the original vector. These are all complex numbers on the unit circle. The real and imaginary parts of these numbers are given by the cosine and sine of the angle between the vector to each point and the positive real axis. Let's take a number q on the unit circle and multiply it with a complex number z. Writing the result in matrix form, we recover the 2D rotation matrix from before. So we see that a multiplication by complex numbers on the unit circle is a 2D rotation. Can we generalize this to three dimensions? If having one imaginary axis can describe rotation about one axis, would having two extra imaginary axes describe rotations about three axes? I'm pretty sure this was definitely not the reasoning behind the invention of quaternions, but as it turns out, quaternions can be used to describe 3D rotations. Similar to complex numbers, quaternions have a real part and an imaginary part. However, the imaginary part has two more axes. In the same way, we can write a quaternion in vector form as a scalar and a vector part. We can skip the addition rules, as they are the same as before, However, we've got new rules for multiplying the imaginary parts. Although it's not that complicated, fully writing down quaternion multiplication is rather lengthy and I'd encourage you to try it on paper as an exercise or refer to the links in the video description. Here I'll state the result. Note that the scalar part and the vector part still contain a scalar number and a vector respectively. Next is the quaternion conjugate, which is identical to complex conjugate. A quaternion is a pure quaternion if its scalar part is zero. We saw that multiplying a complex number on the unit circle with a vector would rotate the vector on a 2D plane. Can we do the same in three dimensions using quaternions? Let's give it a try. First, we need to convert the vector to a quaternion. We can directly put it in the vector part of a quaternion with a zero scalar part, thus constructing a pure quaternion. Now let's say we have a unit length quaternion that we'd like to multiply with our vector in order to rotate it. Using the quaternion multiplication formula, we see that we get a non-zero scalar part in the result, which prevents us from converting back to a 3D vector. So it doesn't work. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. I'm just kidding. Of course, as game engineers, we never give up that easily. Let's multiply the result with the quaternion conjugate of q. It again has a scalar part and a vector part. I'll examine the scalar part first. Writing it out, we see that these terms cancel out and we are left with a single term. We can reorder u and v using the scalar triple product, 
and because the cross product of any vector with itself is zero, we can conclude that we have a pure quaternion here. Now we are getting somewhere. Okay, let's continue with the vector part. To make it easier, I've identified each term in the multiplication formula, so all we have to do is fill them in. Remember that C is the scalar part of our rotation quaternion. Using this cross product identity, we can rewrite the result like so. Now, let's say that the vector part U of our rotation quaternion is a vector with length S and direction A. We can then again rewrite the result of our quaternion vector multiplication. Doesn't this look familiar? Remember the formula for 3D rotations about an arbitrary axis? Looking at them together, we see that they are identical if we apply these equalities. All we have to do is to find what C and S should be in terms of theta. Using these trigonometric identities, we get the values for C and S, and we have the final form of the rotation quaternion. Notice that putting in half the angle of rotation will rotate the vector by twice as much, which is what we want. I hope this derivation of rotation quaternions wasn't too difficult to follow. All we really did was apply a bunch of dot and cross products. I would encourage you to do the derivation on paper and fully write everything out, which really helps to understand the mathematics. One thing that kind of came out of nowhere is this multiplication with the quaternion conjugate, which I'd like to explain a little bit as to why we needed to do that. We're almost there, just bear with me a little longer. First, we can define the inverse of a quaternion using its conjugate. Then we can show that a vector multiplied by a quaternion and its inverse will always result in a pure quaternion, which is exactly what we need when we want to transform a vector. The length of the quaternion doesn't matter for this transformation because it cancels out with its inverse length. However, using unit length quaternions makes it a bit simpler to calculate. And that's the reason for using unit quaternions for rotations, and that's also why previously we could simply use the quaternion conjugate. Hopefully this clears up the full quaternion transformation equation. The final topic that I'd like to discuss is how we actually convert the Euler angles, which we normally use for XYZ axis rotations, into a quaternion. It's really not that complicated. Similar to matrix transformations, we can chain quaternion transformations by multiplying them. So all we have to do is to construct one quaternion for each axis and multiply them together. I should mention that transforming a vector using a quaternion is computationally more expensive than using a rotation matrix. However, when we have multiple rotations that need to be applied to a vector, it's actually faster to multiply quaternions than using matrices. One possible application of multiple rotations is when we are transforming joints in a skeleton hierarchy for an animation. Let me see... I think I'm finally done. <laughs>